actually still <laughs> completing technically, but um, and so Peter's going to talk about uh, parameter derivation uh, in gene regulatory networks. So, thank you, Peter. Hey, thanks for the introduction, uh, and it's uh, great to be here and uh, get a chance to uh, interact with a new department because I'll also be uh, affiliated with BCMB. So, um, a lot of my research interests uh, revolve around uh, getting a multi-scale understanding of regulatory networks, and especially of bacterial uh, regulatory networks. And so, um, my interest in these things starts from a set of experiments that everyone's probably uh, all familiar with on some level. Uh, and these are the um, Jacob and Minode uh, dioxic shift experiment. So, the experiment is, is just the following. It's very simple. You Take a culture of E. coli uh, growing on a mixture of glucose and lactose as carbon sources. And what you'll see is that the cells will grow at some characteristic rate, uh, eating all the glucose until it's exhausted. And then there will be a lag in growth. Uh, and then there will be some uh, slower uh, second uh, phase of growth as the cells use the lactose instead. And the brilliance of Jacobum node is that they understood what this uh, lag meant. And that is that the cells didn't actually make uh, the genes that were required, or the um, gene products that were required to metabolize the lactose until they needed it. And so this is an example of the power of these regulatory networks, that they let organisms uh, adapt uh, their behavior to the circumstances they find themselves in. But this is a very old set of experiments. Recently, we've come to appreciate uh, that there are a lot more subtleties that can be uh, incorporated into these regulatory networks. And one of my favorite examples of this is uh, what we like to call anticipatory regulation. Uh, and uh, a great example of, of this phenomenon is the following. Uh, if you take E. coli, um, which is a uh, microbe that has spent a large chunk of its evolutionary history cycling back and forth between ins being inside the mammalian gut and then outside, and then inside and then outside. If you just take an E. coli culture that is growing at room temperature, and then you raise the temperature to body temperature, uh, you will see the cells shut down their aerobic respiration, uh, induce an acid stress response, and induce a bile salt res uh, resistance response. So they take all of the steps that are required to the survive in the mammalian gut just based on the cue of the temperature rise. And so this is a regulatory network that encodes not just information on how to respond to what the cells see, but to the meaning of that stimulus in an ecological context. And so uh, since this was first uh, really appreciated a couple of years ago, people have found this all over the place in microbes from uh, uh, brewer's yeast, other bacteria, uh, and so it's it's a very powerful uh, trend in these regulatory networks, and it gives you an idea of the kinds of power of these networks to shape microbial behavior. So, yeah, um, we haven't. I don't think that the people who did this looked that much at uh, exactly how fine-tuned the response that it could do. There, they were just jumping from 25 to 37. I know 30 to 37 gives you a meaningful heat shock response. Yeah, but but I, I you know there are, there's plenty of room for nonlinearities in what's going on here. So uh, I I do not know exactly what the sensitivity looks like. Um, so and, and we don't even know if it, if it's just the it, uh, people haven't even worked out if it's the jump or if it's just getting to 37 from somewhere else, pretty much, which which would make sense since that's the temperature they really have to care about. So um, if we want to understand these regulatory networks and eventually use that understanding to either kill bacteria or make them do useful things, which are some of my ambitions, um, we really have to look at all of the different relevant scales and understand these networks on all of the scales uh, that are pertinent to their behavior. And so to, there are two main ones th that I uh, think are important to consider. Uh, on one level, you have to think of these regulatory networks as being a bunch of different biomolecular interactions, because that's actually what they are and how they are physically implemented. Uh, but on the other side, um, you have to look at them on the network level because this is where uh, you really actually get the behavior uh, of the regulatory network uh, driving what the cells do. And so a lot of my uh, work revolves and is going to revolve around um, you, uh, obtaining a uh, predictive understanding of regulatory networks and bacterial regulatory networks on these scales so that we can predict cellular behavior when they're exposed to new stresses or design modifications uh, to the cells, either genetic or chemical perturbations, uh, to make them do what we want. And so, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through a few uh, examples that revolve around this theme. First, I just want to go over uh, a little bit more research that shows uh, just how powerful uh, regulation is in um, shaping bacterial fitness landscapes, uh, and then talk about uh, two specific examples on different uh, levels of detail, 
Uh, first, at the molecular level, a uh, post-translational regulation of a lipase uh, activity that I think is very interesting. And then a method that I've developed for looking at uh, network level uh, effects, and especially for identifying all of the protein uh, DNA uh, interactions in bacterial cells under physiological conditions. So um, just to give more of an appreciation first of the power of these regulatory networks, what really uh, got me uh, into thinking along these lines was an experiment that was done in the Tavazoe lab just before I joined. Uh, this was done by a grad student named Hani Gadarzi. And what he did was uh, evolve a population of E. coli to tolerate increasing levels of ethanol. And so the idea was you could uh, use this uh, in biofuel applications. And so it's a pretty simple experiment. Uh, you start the cells growing at the, in the most ethanol they can and then slowly raise the concentration on the population. And you evolve a population that can deal with up to 6 or 6.5% ethanol instead of 4.5%. And so then Hani used a new method that he had developed to uh, pinpoint the mutations in the genome in the evolved strain that were actually responsible for this phenotype. And the most powerful uh, single effect came from a mut point mutation in the gene rho. So you can see this effect here. If you look at the ability of the relative fitness of the cells in 6.5% ethanol, the wild type cells don't grow at all. Uh, here's the fully evolved strain, and here's the fully evolved strain where you only revert that one mutation to rho. Um, and there's almost a 50% drop in fitness. And so the reason this is interesting to me is the role of rho is to be a transcriptional terminator. It defines the termina termination site of between 30 and 50 percent of the transcripts in E. coli. Um, and all that this row mutation does directly, as far as we can tell, is increase the read-through of some of those termination sites. So all you're going to be doing is elongating some transcripts. And so you can get an idea of what this is going to look like at the molecular level um, from data like this. This is from the uh, Landic lab at Wisconsin. Um, they did uh, ChIP-seq experiments for um, RNA polymerase occupancy around a known row-dependent termination site. Uh, and under uh, normal conditions, you can see a big drop off in occupancy right after the uh, row de dependent termination site, as you'd expect. If you chemically inhibit rho with a compound called bicyclomycin, you instead see increased read through. And so, what we should expect is this rho mutation is just going to be causing read through like this throughout the genome. And so, what really piqued my interest here was first of all, how is this? non-specific sledgehammer of a regulatory mutation causing the cells to gain so much tolerance to ethanol. And since this is going to be a primarily transcriptional uh, effect, we think, uh, the logical place to start was just to look at uh, transcriptional profiling of uh, these uh, row mutant cells compared to wild type cells. And you see a couple of interesting things. First of all, there are about 200 genes out of 4,500 or so in the genome that are differentially expressed. Um, and the presence of this underexpressed sector uh, about 40 of those 200 or so, is actually very interesting. And the reason for that is that the direct effect of uh, perturbations to row-dependent termination, as assessed by, say, that chemical inhibition, is just to cause overexpression of whatever genes are downstream of the row utilization site. And so this uh, underexpressed sector has to be coming from uh, broader network level effects uh, as the uh, effects of the initial perturbation to row-dependent termination propagate through the regulatory network. Now, if your only goal was to figure out how this row mutation is giving ethanol tolerance, you'd actually be able to stop here. Because out of the set of genes that are differentially expressed in this row mutant, uh, there is an overexpression of a couple of genes that are involved in ethanol catabolism. And there is a downregulation of a couple of acid stress response genes that are known to decrease fitness uh, in the presence of ethanol. And so that is how this particular mutation is giving rise to ethanol tolerance is fortuitously it causes a set of gene expression changes that include perturbations that yield ethanol tolerance. But this got me very interested uh, in the possibility that the exact same mutation, the same perturbations, might also give fitness differences under other conditions because this really is a fairly nonspecific effect. And so the way I looked at this was I screened about 300 uh, conditions to see uh, in what other cases the same row mutation would give a change in fitness. And so there were 20 or 25 that had pretty substantial effects. Uh, and here's what you see uh, from these. So what I'm plotting uh, in this chart are the ratio of growth rates between the, the row mutant cells and the wild type cells uh, under a wide variety of conditions. There are two horizontal lines here. Uh, the black dashed line is what that growth rate ratio is under our reference condition, which is just glucose minimal media. Uh, 
uh, and the green dashed line is at one, which is what it would be if there's no effect. And so what you see, first of all, there's a lot of these conditions. So there are a lot of cases where this same mutation is causing substantial perturbations uh, to fitness. Uh, if they go in both directions, there's a wide variety of conditions. Um, and what's even more interesting, I think, is if you tabulate these conditions uh, where there's a substantial uh, difference in the fitness of the cell, you will see um, the same category of stresses show up on both sides of this. So for example, if I highlight all the translational inhibitors, there's one where the row mutation hurts you and three where it helps you out of the panel that I looked at. If you look at DNA gyrase inhibitors, there is one where the row mutation helps you and one where it hurts you. And so each of these changes has to be uh, the result of some specific uh, interactions between the particular uh, changes in gene expression that happen from this one mutation um, and the specific condition that's there. And the reason that this is so powerful, if you think about it in an evolutionary context, is this is a single mutation to a uh, central housekeeping protein in E. coli. And this one mutation can give you uh, beneficial fitness effects under presumably dozens of different conditions. So I found, you know, 15 or so in my uh, study and certainly didn't saturate all of the environments out there. So this has to be representative of a huge reservoir of uh, phenotypic diversity that is accessible through point mutations in bacteria. That should be pretty scary if you're thinking about how to stop bacteria from growing under different conditions because um, they can do a lot. So uh, another interesting thing to think about when you're thinking about the evolutionary effects of this row mutation is it doesn't act alone and it actually interacts with a lot of other things in the gene. And so, for example, just looking uh, at, yeah, sorry. So, right, for most of this, I am defining fitness just as uh, gro using growth rate as a proxy for fitness. You could also do competitive fitness, uh, which is just another metric. Uh, in the limit of infinite times, uh, you know, infinite culture volumes, they're basically equivalent. Unless the cells are actually directly interacting in some way, but these different E. coli strains probably are. Okay. So, um, if we go back for a moment, um, so I was showing this, uh, this a little while ago. If you take the wild type cells, they can't grow in 6.5% ethanol. The evolved strain can. The evolved strain with the row mutation reverted grows, but not as well. Just the row mutation by itself doesn't actually allow the cells to grow at all in 6.5% ethanol. So there has to be another player also. And so to go looking for this, uh, I used a, a fun method called Adam to pinpoint in the, back, in the genetic background of this row mutant what other mutations in the evolved cells contribute most to the fitness uh, in high ethanol concentrations. And the results of this experiment point screamingly toward one mutation in the ribosomal protein RPSL. And so if you look then at the effects of uh, row and RPSL together on uh, th the fitness of cells or the growth of cells, let's say, uh, under uh, different conditions, First of all, just looking in rich media, uh, or rich media with 6% ethanol, which is a little lower than the 6.5% I was showing before. Uh, the wild type cells grow, the row mutant cells grow just a teeny bit better in rich media. Um, in the LB plus 6% ethanol, the wild type cells don't grow at all. The row mutant cells grow, although they're not terribly happy. And then if I fill out this table with the effects of the RPSL mutation, either by itself or in combination with this row mutation, uh, RPSL by itself actually gives you a, a slight decrease in growth rate in rich media, and again by itself doesn't allow any growth in ethanol. Uh, and then you put the two of them together, and you get cells that do the worst in rich media, but the best in the LB plus ethanol. So you have not only direct effects of this row mutation, but also condition-dependent epistatic interactions with other mutations throughout the genome, which is just showing you how quickly you can generate a lot of phenotypic diversity uh, through these kinds of mutations. Uh, so, just to give even more uh, of an appreciation, I'd like to say, of um, the power of regulatory mutations, uh, we took this to a, a broader level uh, and looked at, uh, did a meta-analysis of um, knockout libraries selected under different conditions. And so the, uh, the, the reason this is linked to uh, regulatory uh, mutations is anytime you have a single gene knockout, it's basically equivalent to a regulatory network just shutting down that gene. And so we were wondering uh, what kind of fitness diversity you could generate uh, just by looking at single gene knockout, knockouts. And so we looked at 144 different conditions. And what I think is very interesting is under all but five of them, you could find at least one single gene knockout that improves fitness uh, under that condition. And the average is actually quite a few, in, in the order of 20 or so, uh, 
uh, knockouts that are going to improve um, fitness. And so this, again, is showing you, first of all, the power of regulation, because like I said, these are equivalent to just shutting down uh, a gene. Second, it's showing you the general principle that the uh, biochemical capacity of bacterial cells to survive under diff different conditions far exceeds what their regulatory network can tell them to do. Uh, because they're obvi it's obvious that if you look at this data, the cells could be doing better under a lot of these conditions if their regulatory network was doing the right thing um, with them. Uh, and also, again, should scare you in terms of how easy it is to generate phenotypic diversity in these populations, because all of these single gene knockouts are equivalent to one nonsense mutation. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to generate a loss of function mutation. So this kind of diversity can establish itself very, fairly quickly. You can do the back of the envelope calculation. If you have one milliliter of cells in LB, which is rich media, you have a single gene knockout for every gene in the genome there, by all, in all likelihood. So this diversity is already present. Uh, and what makes this even more interesting, I think, is if you look at the overrepresentation or underrepresentation of different classes of genes, among these genes where, where uh, knocking out the gene gives you uh, beneficial uh, phenotypic effects, the four classes that are uh, significantly overrepresented, the ones shown in blue here, uh, structural genes, regulatory genes, RNA, and uh, enzymes. Again, you see regulators showing up, uh, both through their direct effects and uh, indirect effects, as being so important uh, to the adaptation of populations to new conditions. So, I think there are a couple of big lessons to take from all of this work on uh, what I could, I'd call the adaptive power of bacterial regulatory networks. First of all, uh, and this comes mostly from the Rho uh, mutation I was talking about, uh, mutations to core, said, uh, core cell functions have a huge variety of fitness effects and can be beneficial under a lot of conditions. In the last couple of years, people have really uh, appreciated this is not just true for Rho, but also RNA polymerase mutations, lots of other uh, core functions end up getting mutated uh, in bacterial populations that are evolving under stressful conditions and can let you adapt to pretty much anything you want to. Um, and even uh, true loss of function mutations give you uh, a way to get uh, rapid adaptations to stressful conditions because, again, under almost any stress condition you want to throw out, there's some loss of function mutation that's going to make the cells do better. So. Um, there are a couple of future questions that come up if we look at these, the, the power of these regulatory networks. Um, some of the things we'd like to understand, what are the most common mechanisms that are driving these phenotypes? How is, say, this row mutation exerting its effect under all these different conditions where it ends up helping the cell? Um, what role do these mutations play in non-laboratory evolution? Because as I was saying, we've noticed uh, through a lot of people's experiments over the last couple of years that these show up a lot in lab evolution experiments, but we don't have enough appreciation yet of how often these kinds of mutations are showing up in, say, clinical populations. Uh, and how can we take advantage of all of these different ways to perturb bacterial physio physiology for, say, uh, biotechnology applications where we might want the cells to do something, do it well? Um, and so a lot of the work I'm going to be doing once I show up here uh, is based around building the uh, quantitative understanding of these regulatory networks that we need uh, to answer some of those questions. And I'd like to do it in a very, uh, using a very uh, highly multi-scale interdisciplinary approach uh, where we really try to understand uh, everything from the atomic level up to cells and even population. And so uh, there's a broad variety of techniques that certainly I'll be applying and also uh, others not listed here to um, collaborating with people uh, to use to attack these problems, everything from uh, molecular simulation up through laboratory evolution experiments. Uh, and I'd like to spend the rest of the time that I have today uh, talking about two specific examples uh, of using some of these methods to look at very different uh, size scales in regulation. And so the first example uh, is uh, just using uh, molecular simulation to look at the post-translational regulation of the activity of a particular lipid. And so lipases are an interesting class of enzymes uh, that are, in general, um, going to uh, catalyze uh, hydrolysis of esters. And they generally have very broad substrate specificity if you leave them to their own devices. So basically, all known lipases undergo something that's called interfacial activation, which is a kind of post-translational regulation. The lipases, when they are in aqueous solution, will take on a closed conformation where the active site is covered and the cells can't actually hydrolyze anything. This prevents them from targeting anything uh, that they shouldn't. 
But when they are in the presence of a hydrophobic hydrophilic interface, there's some conformational transition uh, that we understand pretty well in some lipases, but not so much in others, uh, where uh, a lid lifts above the active site uh, and the enzyme becomes active. And so you can see how this works very clearly uh, in some lipase crystal structures we have. This one is uh, Candida rugosa lipase. Um, and so you can see here's the open state. I guess I probably should have put that on the left. Uh, there's an active site in here, and then there's this uh, blue lid domain in the closed state uh, that you get in the absence of an interface. You just get coverage uh, of this uh, active site by the lid domain, and then the enzyme is basically catalytically inactive. And so for a lot of lipases, you can appreciate uh, how strong this interfacial activation is, and it goes from mild to very strong, um, by looking at the relative activity of the enzyme for, say, a small chromogenic substrate um, in the presence of increasing concentrations of SDS, which is going to mimic the effects of the hydrophobic interface uh, on the lipase. And so um, this uh, hemocola lipase, for example, when you titrate, titrate up the SDS, can get up to about a 35-fold increase in activity. Uh, Canada and Arctica lipase A does a five or six fold increase. And then you have the black sheep of the family, which is Canada and Arctica lipase B, which actually does not show any interfacial activation at all in these experiments. It's, just, it's I think it has been for a while, the only uh, proper lipase that doesn't do this that people are aware of. Uh, and my collaborator, Kirsten Blank, and I got interested in this enzyme because it, this behavior is so atypical for a lipase. But this lipase is very commercially important. It's used in a lot of biotechnology applications um, for its ability to hydrolyze a wide variety of esters and do so in a uh, stereochemical, stereospecific way. Uh, and so we wanted to understand uh, at a structural level what is uh, CalB doing? Is there actually interfacial activation we're not picking up here? What's going on? And so uh, the set of experiments that Kirsten and her group did uh, was the following. Uh, she took a set of glass beads that were prepared with um, surfaces of varying hydrophobicities, uh, ranging from a C1 modification up through C8, and even there's, they did a C18 modification also, uh, and then looked at the uh, catalytic, catalytic efficiency of uh, CalB for a wide variety of substrates. And so just, just to give a feel for the kinds of substrates that are being used, here, here are a few of them. Excuse me. They are all either chromogenic or fluorogenic, uh, and you have from the very small um, to uh, the quite large in the fluorescein dibutyrate. Uh, and so, if you look at the uh, activity of this enzyme in the present for on different substrates in the presence of different degrees of surface hydrophobicity, um, if you look at uh, paranitrophenylbutyrate, for example, which is uh, pretty typical small substrate, you see no interfacial activation, which is consistent with previous results uh, for this enzyme. But if you get up to the bulkier substrates, you see that there actually is interfacial activation in this case, that you have a huge increase in enzymatic activity for the more hydrophobic surfaces. And this, is act this actually doesn't even happen nearly to the same extent for FDA, um, which just has a shorter uh, Um And so we wanted to understand at a structural level what's going on with this. So um, Kirsten got in touch with me and we did some uh, molecular dynamics simulations uh, to try and understand uh, at a structural level what is causing this uh, substrate dependent interfacial activation. And so we started out with just some vanilla simulations to see what the uh, mobility of different parts of this enzyme look like. Uh, and what you see in general is the enzyme is very stable. Here's, here's the uh, enzyme, here's the active site. Uh, and then if you color it by uh, the RMSF uh, on a moderate length molecular dynamics trajectory, you see there's one very mobile helix uh, that looks like it's doing uh, most of the interesting stuff. And this is, uh, this already should be piquing your interest because this is, looks exactly like the kind of lid that you see in a lot of other lipases, except people thought that Calbi isn't doing any interfacial activation until now. So to get a feel for what this thing could be doing, we did then a, a longer series of um, replica exchange simulations to get some enhanced sampling and to get a feel for um, what the, the landscape of accessible conformations looks like in this enzyme. And we came out with three basic classes of conformations. Uh, the first are, there are a lot of crystal-like conformations that look pretty much like the crystal structure and have a moderately open active site. And then you have some that have a very highly open active site, and then some others where you get a closed structure that looks very much like the closed structures of other lipases. And so this enzyme uh, is clearly sampling back and forth um, between these conformations. Uh, and it's pretty easy to understand, if you just look at the structure, how this might interact with interfacial activation, because 
just like a lot of other enzymes, there's a lot of hydrophobic surface on the lid helix and the other stuff um, in that area. And so you can imagine uh, that it's going to have a uh, effect on the conformational distribution of this enzyme if you have a hydro hydrophobic interface present. Yeah. They were done in the absence of a modeled interface. Yeah, and so I'm going to, I, I um, did a, yeah, yeah, even in the absence of the interface, you're sampling all these different uh, conformations. But, and what's interesting, if you just take a very crude model then of the interface, I pulled out 25 representative conformations from these simulations, and then take a very crude model for the interface where you just, you have water, you have a hydrophobic slab, and you have an impenetrable slab. And I'm using this to pretty much mimic uh, the experimental setup. And you take empirical values for the free energy effects of burial of different hydrophobic side, or different side chains, I should say, in the hydrophobic slab, you can approximate the effects of this interface on the conformational distribution of the enzyme. What you see is in solution, there's roughly equal population of these three different general classes of uh, structures, whereas the presence of the interface drives it strongly toward uh, the more open structures, which would be consistent with interfacial activation. Now, this is only actually going to be interesting is if we can close the loop and see how uh, driving things toward the more open structure is going to uh, interact with different substrates. So then we docked all the different uh, experimental substrates that we were that um, were used by our collaborators to the um, representative conformations we were looking at, uh, and then looked at uh, the distribution of uh, relative binding energies um, from the docking uh, for different substrates uh, and how that interacts with cleft distance. So here there are points at all of the uh, catalytically competent uh, bound conformations. Uh, that are present showing their relative binding energy to the best binder, uh, and then they're on the y-axis at the appropriate position for the cleft distance that you get from the bound structure. So roughly this range is where the crystal structure is. These are what I would consider to be the closed structures. Up here are the open structures. And you can see there's not very much presence for this small substrate, but uh, in comparison, FDB, which is the one that experimentally showed the interfacial activation, uh, has a much stronger presence for one particularly open structure where actually the lid helix is unfolded slightly uh, and in general uh, has much less uh, ability to bind to the closed structure. So it looks like this is going to explain the substrate dependent interfacial activation that you're getting just because the large substrate uh, cannot bind uh, in a catalytically competent, catalytically competent way uh, to the closed structure of the enzyme which is then destabilized in the presence of an interface. So, what do we get from this? Uh, CalBee is an unusual lipase because it shows substrate dependent interfacial activation. It looks like it has this alpha 5 helix that I talked about that acts like the lid domain would, or the, the uh, lid helix would in a lot of other lipases. Um, but, unlike a lot of other lipases, free CalBee can act uh, as an esterase for small substrates, which can apparently get in even to the closed structure. Uh, bulky substrates require lid opening. So, uh, given this, there are some interesting follow-up questions to look at, such as what's the physiological role of this, du of this dual activity, uh, given that most lipases uh, appear to have interfacial activation for a reason? Are there any other lipases that share this mechanism? Uh, and how can we use uh, what we now understand about the interfacial activation of CalB uh, to uh, engineer it to improve the uh, biotechnology application of this use? All right. So, for the rest of the time I have, I'd like to shift over to the exact opposite end of my scale and look at the regulatory network level uh, and talk in particular about a method that I've been working on um, during my postdoctoral work for identifying um, protein DNA interactions uh, in a nonspecific way in uh, E. coli cells and the physiological condition. And so, um, the, what motivated this uh, particular uh, piece of method development was uh, thinking of how you could go about understanding a uh, regulatory behavior uh, that involved a lot of different transcription factors. And so this, this might be, for example, uh, the um, anticipatory regulation example that I was showing at the beginning of the talk, where you have a lot of apparently unrelated uh, operons uh, being regulated by a common stimulus. There has to be some interesting regulation going on here. There are probably lots of different transcription factors involved. And so if you look across the, the usual suspects in terms of method, you can do RNA-seq or, or an RNA microarray, and you can see the transcriptional output. But this tells me nothing about uh, the molecular logic that's giving rise to that output. You could do ChIP-seq experiments, and you could identify uh, for each experiment where a given protein is bound to the genome under a given physiological condition. 
condition. But that means you're doing one experiment for each protein for each condition. You have to pick the proteins you want to look at ahead of time. You may miss something if you don't pick the right ones. It ends up being a prohibitive number of experiments. So how do we track a complex regulatory response? And the answer was to develop a method that lets you get a single profile that shows all of the protein occupancy on the genome under physiological conditions uh, in E. coli. Um, and so this is very similar, for example, to what people can get with DNA's hypersensitivity uh, experiments in eukaryotic cells, um, but it doesn't uh, rely on uh, some aspect of their genome architecture. So uh, the way these methods work is the following. You grow the cells under the condition of interest. You cross-link um, proteins to DNA. And so here I'm drawing the DNA as a pair of uh, purple lines, and then different proteins as ovals. Uh, and so you form covalent cross-links with formaldehyde or ultraviolet light. You lyse the cells, you sonicate them, and then you enzymatically minimize the bound footprints uh, uh, under the protein. And so up until this point, this is looking exactly like a ChIP-seq workflow might look. But in a ChIP-seq workflow, you would then use an antibody to pull out uh, all of the uh, protein DNA complexes that involve a single protein. What we do here instead is just a modified phenyl chloroform extraction. And so in a normal phenyl chloroform extraction, you would mix the cell lysates with phenol, uh, and you would end up with an aqueous phase that has all the DNA and an organic phase that has all the proteins in it. If you do this in cross-linked cells, we have protein DNA uh, covalent complexes, you end up getting an interface layer that's not present in a typical phenyl chloroform extraction, this nice thick white disk. Uh, and this ends up containing the DNA protein complexes because it's amphipathic. And this layer is stable enough you can isolate it, you can wash it to minimize background, and then you can recover the DNA from it and sequence it and compare it to an input sample and, and get a one-dimensional occupancy profile through the genome of where protein is bound. And so the method, this method uh, was originally called iPod. It had been developed uh, before I showed up in the lab. And it gave some of what people wanted, but it had a lot of problems. And in particular, uh, it didn't have high enough resolution to be useful for finding transcription factor binding sites. Uh, yes? Uh -huh. So by, by architecture, I just mean DNA's hypersensitivity is going to rely a lot on nucleosome occupancy. And that's, that's uh, really a dominant part of that signal. And here we don't have uh, nucleosomes. So uh, you're going to get a very different. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about architecture in the, the, the 40, you know, 3D, 40 sense that you're probably interested in a little later. Uh, but haven't gotten that much into that with this method yet. Um, so uh, the original iPod method also had a lot of contamination of the signal from RNA polymerase occupancy. Uh, and it didn't have any way of identifying which protein uh, was giving rise to each binding site in the genome, which is pretty important if you want to understand what this is doing. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to uh, develop a method that lets you solve these problems, give you better resolution, get rid of the confounding effects of RNA polymerase occupancy, and at least start on uh, identifying which proteins are giving rise to different occupancy peaks once you get this high resolution signal. And this becomes what I call iPod HR, which is uh, in vivo protein occupancy display at high resolution. I should add, I recently switched to using a Mac, and it's actually it's very annoying writing this because Macs will automatically correct the phrase iPod to be capitalized the way Apple likes to capitalize. It's a little self effect So just to give an idea, first of all, before I get into what you see in general uh, with these methods of how iPod and iPod HR compare, um, this is a uh, chunk of genome showing an iPod signal versus an iPod HR signal. And what you see with the iPod signal, there are a couple problems. First of all, it's fairly low resolution. And second, anywhere like in this region and this region, these are highly transcribed regions. And you see signal that's dominated by RNA polymerase occupancy. Uh, and not much else. And so with the iPod HR signal in comparison, you get a cleaner signal that has peaks at known transcription factor binding sites mostly, and then other intergenic regions, which uh, presumably also correspond to uncharacterized transcription factor binding sites. It'll help you appreciate uh, a lot of this, the rest of this talk if I tell you now that even for E. coli, we only have good information about where roughly 30% of the transcription factors are binding. And even for a lot of those, we're probably missing a lot of the binding sites. And this really, if you think about E. coli as sort of a hydrogen atom of regulatory networks, this is pretty shameful. So, so we need to be doing a better job. Um, but I think this would explain why you do see a lot of occupancy peaks that don't correspond to known transcription factor binding sites. Uh, this is a problem we'd like to help remedy. Um, so first of all, before we get into any uh, small details, if you just look at the overall characteristics of the iPod HR signal, what you would like to see ideally is a signal that is enriched at known transcription factor binding sites, and in general is enriched at 
uh, intergenic regions, which are presumably the sites of uh, uncharacterized transcription factor binding sites for the most part. And that's exactly what you see. If for each of the colors of lines you shift from the dashed line to the solid line, um, this, this is showing now a cumulative histogram of the iPod HR signals uh, for these different parts of the genome. If you go from the dashed line to the solid line, then you are going from a site with no known transcription factor binding site to a site with a known annotated transcription factor binding site. And this rightward shift that you see in both cases indicates that the occupancy is higher at the known transcription factor binding site. And similarly, if you shift for each uh, line style from the red line to the black line, you're going from a coding to a non-coding region. And again, you see the rightward shift uh, indicative of enriched occupancy at the uh, non-coding regions, as we expect. So at the broad zoomed out level, this seems to be doing well. Unfortunately, um, this also uh, does well uh, with uh, identifying uh, physiologically known, physiologically relevant changes in transcription factor binding. And I should add that in, this, in the process I'm going to show exactly how important the subtraction of RNA polymerase occupancy is. Um, if you look at a raw signal before the uh, correction for uh, RNA polymerase occupancy, um, this is a known pure R binding site, which should be um, occupied in um, rich media and uh, absent, in, and binding here should be absent in minimal media, because this is repressing uh, expression of pure C, which is upregulated in minimal media. Now, if you look at the uncorrected occupancy signals, you can see a pretty strong occupancy peak in both rich and minimal media at the pure R site. This is not Recording. Cool. <laughs> All right, so um, you can see immediately why this is. Uh, if you also do an RNA polymerase uh, chip seek experiment, and you see massive occupancy here in the minimal media condition, which is expected because this gene is actually on in minimal media. And so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is the true iPod HR signal is a properly normalized subtraction of the RNA polymerase occupancy from the uh, iPod uh, signal. And when you get that, uh, when you do that, you get this profile, which gives you, as expected, uh, this strong occupancy of the pure R site only in rich media. There are plenty of other examples of this. Uh, for example, here's a gene, one of the most highly differentially regulated genes between rich and minimal media is MET-E. There are a couple of MET-R sites that are known to activate MET-E um, in minimal media, and you can see this occupancy uh, very strongly. It's uh, condition specific and localized to those uh, known MET-R sites. What gets more interesting is if you start looking at highly differentially regulated genes that don't have any transcription factor binding sites uh, upstream of them. And so here are a couple examples of these. Here's Thy-C, uh, which is 200-fold upregulated in minimal media. Um, and what you can see in the iPod signal, first of all, there's, there are no annotated transcription factor binding sites here, but you see uh, very cleanly a change in iPod HR occupancy between these conditions, and in particular, what sure looks like a repressor binding site showing up here, where we'd like to figure out what this is, but this is probably important in the differential regulation we see in this gene. And similarly, here's uh, SDAC, which is strongly down-regulated in minimal media. Uh, and here you have a couple of um, occupancy sites. There's one that's occupied in both rich and minimal media, uh, and then one that's occupied only in minimal media. Again, this overlaps uh, the uh, promoter and is probably serving as a repressor in minimal media. So, there's a lot of room here, I think, now that we have these signals and that they show uh, occupancy changes uh, in areas where we don't have any known transcription factor binding sites to start figuring out um, what, uh, what is the actual molecular logic that's giving rise to this differential regulation. Now, aside from these uh, very fine grain uh, details that you can see with iPod HR, you also see some uh, interesting uh, effects when you zoom out a little bit. And I think one of the most interesting of these are the presence of what we call EPODs. It stands for Extended Protein Occupancy Domain. And what you see if you look throughout the uh, 
genome at the iPod HR signals. For the most point, it's very peaky. It's concentrated at these transcription factor binding sites. But then there are some regions that just show a wall of occupancy. And alongside that, you generally see RNA polymerase occupancy driven down below uh, background levels. So these look like very densely occupied uh, regions of the genome that are also transcriptionally silent. Uh, and in addition, they have an overrepresentation uh, of binding sites for several nucleoid proteins, both known sites and predicted sites. Um, and so these EPODs look like they're probably playing a regulatory role in silencing the genes that are there. And there are some uh, particular classes of genes that are enriched in EPODs. But also they're probably playing an architectural role by serving as uh, organizing centers for uh, nucleoid protein occupancy on the bacterial genome. So this, uh, I think is this one. In general, they range from about 2 kb to 10 or 20 kb. Uh, and uh, there's an, another interesting feature of these uh, EPODs uh, is that you can uh, correlate their presence with uh, genome confirmation capture data. And this is very similar to, say, hi c It's giving you a measure of, uh, of the uh, interactions between different parts of the genome. And so if I just take this and collapse it to one dimension and give a plot along the genome of the propensity of different parts of the genome to interact with other things. So this is pretty much how central these different parts of the genome are. And then I superimpose the local EPOD density on these. They're strongly anti-correlated. Um, the Spearman row is like minus 0.3. Um, and so this gives you an idea that not only are the EPODs serving the regulatory and the structural features I was talking about before, but they also appear to be topologically, or not topologically, but they appear to be spatially isolated from the rest of the genome uh, in some way, because they have a reduced propensity for interacting with the rest of the genome. Now, one other quick thing, and then I'll uh, open things up to questions. Uh, and this is, I think, the uh, area of most active uh, development for me right now. There's that last problem of figuring out, OK, you get this one-dimensional occupancy profile. How do you figure out what transcription factor corresponds to each of these sites to really read the molecular logic out of this state? And so there's a combination of approaches you can use for this. Uh, if you look at the iPod sites, the, the, the peaks that you get out of this signal, about a third of them correspond to some annotated site. So we already know what those are, uh, probably. Uh, and about another third uh, correspond to computationally predicted sites for one of the 60 or so transcription factors that we have a good position weight matrix for. Um, and the rest of them are unassigned, and we'd like to figure out uh, how to assign those to some transcription factor uh, that we may not even know the specificity of. And so what I've been working on, which actually turns out to be very interesting, is inferring from these occupancy profiles um, the uh, set of uh, position weight matrices that is most likely to give rise to this signal. And so we do this with a mutual information-based approach called FIRE that was developed in the Tavazoli lab with some modification. What FIRE does in general uh, is it tries to identify um, sequence motifs where the presence of that motif it has a high mutual information with the cluster assignment uh, of a given sequence in some scalar metric. In this case, we use as the scalar the um, iPod occupancy, uh, and then try to find position weight matrices uh, that would give rise, or that have a high mutual information with the occupancy profile. And so what you get are inference of a bunch of motifs like this, um, here is uh, a set of occupancy clusters going from low to high. Um, the yellow uh, bins are enriched. The blue bins are depleted. And so these are all uh, examples of position weight matrices inferred just from using this data and nothing else uh, that have a high enrichment of the highest bin of iPod HR occupants. And if you look at these position weight matrices, first of all, you see that some of them show uh, significant correlations with known uh, E. coli position weight matrices. And so here's just an example of this. Here's one of the uh, inferred motifs with fire, uh, and it's superimposed with the chlorar motif. So you get 30%, uh, you get matches to about 30% of known position weight matrices under any particular condition doing inference in this method, and keeping in mind, of course, that not every transcription factor is going to be active in each condition. Uh, and then you also get inference of a bunch of other motifs that look very uh, transcription factor binding site-like in the sense of their symmetry and other characteristics, but don't correspond to any known position weight matrices. And so these are very likely going to correspond to um, some of the unknown uh, so position weight matrices for some of the unknown or uncharacterized uh, transcription factors that we can then follow up on. So there's a lot of room at this point for both development and application uh, of this method in the future. On the development side, uh, 
we can improve the motif inference and start uh, doing a better job then of assigning uh, different uh, occupancy peaks to um, motifs and eventually to different transcription factors. Uh, I'm also collaborating with the Christie lab at Princeton to do sort of an inverse experiment and get the protein abundance in the protein DNA complexes under different conditions for different proteins in the genome, which would be a, a very uh, useful extra constraint. Uh, and then there's uh, a lot of possibility for synergy with molecular modeling of protein DNA complexes to look at some of these uh, specificities. And then on the application side, we're working on uh, figuring out more about the structural and regulatory effects of these EPODs I was talking about. Uh, and then using this method uh, to look at the molecular logic of complex regulatory programs, both in E. coli and pretty soon in other organisms also, because one of the great advantages of being agnostic to the particular transcription factors that are involved is you don't need to know anything about the regulatory network ahead of time to apply this method to an organism. Okay, so uh, the grand vision, if you will, uh, which I was going over before, is using a hierarchy of multi-scale, multidisciplinary approaches to uh, get a quantitative understanding of regulatory networks. And over time, I'd like to see this uh, drive toward, uh, first of all, doing both the experimental and computational work to gather parameters and topologies for the regulatory network and then eventually be able to use this to move towards cell scale models and really get predictive cell scale models of these regulatory networks to predict and design cellular behavior. So uh, I'd like to briefly thank uh, all the people who were involved in the different aspects uh, of the work that I was talking about today. And also mention, since there are probably bioinformatics uh, students uh, in the audience, that I am accepting rotation students for this uh, uh, term starting in January and also for the spring and summer terms. I'd love to have anybody who's interested uh, drop me an email at uh, pfred at unishtud.edu. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. What? I'm using my UMish, yeah. That's what I gave. It works, yes. <laughs> which is which is a benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. It, um, it seems like it would be very sensitive to how the proteins react with that phenylchloroform extraction mm -hmm. step. So I'm wondering if you've done any quantitative comparisons with the kind of readouts you get from that versus chip seek data, which mm -hmm. are quantitative. Yeah, so what I'm what I am working on right now, so so what I'm working on right now for a couple of different um, proteins is to look at precisely that. What I can tell you already is that you can very clearly see um, by looking at the occupancy that you get of um, known binding sites for different transcription factors that there are a lot of proteins that behave very well in terms of coming out with this interface, but there are others that don't at all. And so for example, uh, it, what was it? So CRP doesn't show up at all in the interface. Lac repressor doesn't even cross-link with formaldehyde, so that's not going to show up. So you are definitely going to miss something. I'm playing with, for example, ultraviolet cross-linking instead of formaldehyde cross-linking to get lac repressor. Um, so this is not going to be a replacement for ChIP-seq, but here the advantage is you get the broad survey so quickly. And I'm working now on giving a more quantitative understanding of exactly what those limits are. It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. How to use this in eukaryotes? Um, because you'd really want to subtract. I mean, instead of doing nucleosomes, which is what everybody does, uh, you'd want to subtract anything bound to histones. Yeah. Uh, and you might be able to, you know, taking off on the differential sensitivity to interface trapping. Mm -hmm. uh, histones are so damn basic. Yeah. Uh, you might be able to just do an acid extraction and if. You know, after a microcochlear or something digestion to get yourself down to a high protein to DNA ratio. Yeah, which is what I do anyway. I mean, it's DNA is one, but same principle. Um, and and uh, just extract out the histones and and have a, a small enough data sets that you can actually ask the same sort of questions, mm -hmm. uh, starting with small. That's on the to-do list. I've got. I have. There are some yeast strains sitting sitting in my freezer right now, and that's not coincidental. So th this is definitely on the to-do list. I think it'll be fun to look. Yep. Yeah, you guys are you guys are reading my mind in so many ways. Actually, yes, I've been playing with that as well. And and you can see you can see very clearly in these cross-link samples, in addition to this behavior in the uh, phenol telephone extraction, you can see the shifted population uh, if you just run it out on a gel uh, of the protein-bound DNA that's way outside the population of digested fragments that you're getting. And so you can do size selections in that way. And presumably, if you do this in eukaryotic cells, 
yeah, you're going to get a huge nucleosome band that you can get rid of and then take everything else. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. So it's bis is enriched, HU is enriched, and yeah, HU is, HNS is pretty much all the regular suspects in nucleoid proteins. And actually, I didn't show this, but I'll just I should have put this slide in because I just found it uh, recently. Actually, in in some of the if you process the data uh, right, uh, you can actually identify an underlying periodic signal um, in the genome that has just the right spacing to be HU occupancy. Uh, and shows all the characteristics that you would expect of that. So I think underlying some of this other stuff, you can see very clearly the HU occupancy throughout the genome. Uh, and so I'm, I'm following up on that right now. Yeah. Peter, thank you for the talk. Is there something uh, special that could be applied to the microbiome? I mean, there's a lot of research. Well, so yeah, I think I think this is a great technique, and one of the reasons I like it, it's a great technique for looking at this. Now, you wouldn't want to do this in the meta genome sense where you throw everything in simultaneously. But what I think is great about this method is you can parachute in on a new regulatory network. And if the experience with E. coli is any judge, you could do this on a new microbe and come out immediately with 30% of its position weight matrices uh, by inference in this thing. If you can figure out then, uh, you know, where under relevant conditions like an antibiotic treatment or a change that happens in the digestive tract, you can figure out where all the regulatory hotspots are and what proteins have to be responsible. And then you can zoom in on only those sites and you can figure out what transcription factors are important uh, and things like that. So I think there is a lot of potential. I have some grants uh, under consideration right now for doing just this, to move to regulatory networks of important microorganisms that we don't know very much about. And using this method and some related methods to figure out what we can very quickly about the regulatory. Uh, see, I think there's one back here and he beat you by like half a second. So. Uh, so you, uh, you're saying that you want to combine, look at different scales of regulatory networks. Mm -hmm. And do you have any, any ideas how to combine your, your iPod method with the atom scale processes? Yeah, so what I'm, uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, the synergy between what you can do with iPod, which is giving you an idea of where there's stuff bound, for sure and what position weight matrices roughly will represent the affinity landscapes of the different proteins running around. And then at the molecular level, we can uh, look at things like, um, by free energy perturbation uh, calculations, figure out what the binding landscape looks like for um, a, a given DNA binding protein. And of course, we're likely to do badly with that initially. So there's a whole separate road to take in terms of optimizing those uh, force fields to do a good job with that, which I think is going to be something very useful to do uh, and will be fun to be involved in. Uh, and also look at the uh, interactions, the site-site interactions that you're going to get as a result of um, DNA binding to, uh, proteins. And what I mean by that is if you look at um, the effects on DNA architecture of any transcription factor binding event, they all bend DNA in some way. And if you look at, so there's some great experiments, I forget the name of the lab recently, there are some great experiments showing that there's a huge effect of the binding of one transcription factor to DNA on the propensity of a different transcription factor to bind at a site that's fairly distant, but within the persistence length of DNA. So it appears that there are effects uh, on the DNA, ar DNA architecture. And so I think cataloging um, what these effects might be can be done both experimentally and computationally. It would be a great way to understand uh, what these effects are. Dave, you had a question also that was just missed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, I mean, there's there's people who work in bacteria to actually look at this under the microscope. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought of of uh, collaborating with somebody oh, yeah. uh, to try to relate that data to, mm -hmm. to visuals? Yeah, very much so. And I think so. So you can look both at the macro and the micro scale. You know, the, the like Shea Lab at Harvard is like the, the archetypal example of this, right? And so actually, uh, after I dig a little bit deeper on, for example, the HU signal that I'm seeing, part of what has me so excited about that particular signal is the periodicity of it exactly matches what the Shea lab has been saying has to be the occupancy of some nucleoid protein throughout the genome. And it shows the right behavior in terms of being depleted from highly transcribed genes uh, and things like that. So I think once a little more work is done, it'll be great to get in touch with them because I can then give a uh, very easy molecular assay to map all of this stuff out and then correlate to some some targeted experiments and things like that. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work to use up.
you mentioned looking at uh, non-laboratory conditions or and the effects of uh, mutations in, in non-laboratory right, conditions. Right, so going what, back to the, the um, adaptive uh, effect of regulatory perturbations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering what, what do you think uh, or what do you anticipate would be the major differences there uh, between the way uh, mutations affect the regulatory networks, you know, in lab laboratory conditions versus non-laboratory conditions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And there, there is actually reason to think that this is the case, and here's why. If you just look, first of all, at that row mutation I was talking about, uh, it gives a 5% increase in the fitness of cells under laboratory conditions. If, now, 5% is a huge amount in the bacterial fitness world. That's, that's a very strong selective advantage. So if this was actually beneficial, that's what wild type E. coli would be running around with. Um, so what is likely is that um, a lot of these regulatory perturbations probably help you under some handful of conditions, but they hurt the versatility of the cells and they hurt this uh, ingrained regulatory network that gives the cells the right answers under so many different conditions that they're going to experience in non-laboratory conditions because life is hard outside of a test tube. You gotta you know, deal with all kinds of different stresses, they change over time, and their regulatory networks are really good at dealing with this. So I think it's an open question uh, what kind of impact these uh, impairments of the native regulatory network uh, are going to have uh, in non-laboratory conditions. But I think it's very important to look at because of the potential of these mutations to do a lot in terms of especially dealing with antibiotics. Anything else? Cool. Well, thank you very, all very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Exciting and caffeinated. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. I really appreciate it.